thank you very much. Um, now, can everyone see my slides? We see them, Jim. Okay, very good. Well, thanks again, John, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak at this uh, uh, meeting. So for the next few minutes, what I would like to do is explore MSTAPA, uh, the first specific treatment for uh, TPA-induced bleeding. MSTAPA is a monoclonal antibody fragment that we're developing uh, that will inhibit tissue plasminogen activator, a protein in the, uh, the blood that drives the digestion and removal of blood clots. Uh, TPA is a natural uh, product that's produced by the endothelial cells of the blood vessel. And it's also been uh, produced as a synthetic TPA used as a drug to uh, treat life-threatening blood clots. However, there's a downside to TPA in that in a small percentage of patients, it can cause weakening of the blood vessel and this can perpetuate major bleeding. And so our MSTAPA is an emergency treatment that stops the bleeding produced by uh, this overactivity of TPA. As you can see in the cartoon below, uh, a major clot can form and occlude a vessel and then uh, patients present to hospital with the symptoms of stroke or heart attack or a blood clot in the lung, a pulmonary embolus, and TPA is administered intravenously to dissolve or lyse that clot. However, uh, in five to seven percent of cases in ischemic stroke and 10 to 15 percent of uh, patients with pulmonary emboli, uh, the blood vessels begin to leak and severe hemorrhage can result. And so our concept is to stop that bleeding by inhibiting the exaggerated activity of TPA. Uh, sorry, Jim, to cut you off. Um, the audience is um, wondering if you can share your screen in presenter mode. Um, so, because right now what we're seeing are two slides um, side by side in the text. Is ah, kindly. Thank you very much, Jim. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Let me see, presenter mode. Maybe uh, related to my uh, version of uh, the, uh, maybe better for me to just dim, uh, to do it in this manner. Can everyone see this more clearly? Yep, that looks a lot better. Thank you, Jim. Okay. All right. So sorry for that uh, problem. So uh, the blood vessels are under a continuous amount of pulsatile stress uh, and uh, wall strain as well as uh, shear stresses with blood flow. And over time, a response to injury occurs that results in the uh, the actual formation of atherosclerotic plaques. So this is a, a carotid artery uh, that's rendered uh, in three dimensions from a CT angiogram. And you can see that the flow of blood in white is constricted at the region of this plaque. And the plaque has a large necrotic core in, in uh, green, uh, as well as calcification. And our problem occurs when these plaques rupture and uh, a thrombus occurs at either the site of the plaque rupture or a thrombus forms and then breaks off and travels, uh, for example, to the brain, producing an ischemic stroke caused by occlusion of a cerebral vessel. We can also have a similar phenomena occur in the coronary arteries. Uh, and this is the left anterior descending coronary artery and the left circumflex. And in this case, uh, the atherosclerotic plaque uh, is composed mostly of intraplaque hemorrhage, again resulting in stenosis 
and that actually can rupture and produce acute thrombosis. So TPA has been used for over 20 years to treat ischemic stroke, uh, pulmonary embolism, and myocardial infarction. And this bleeding side effect that we're talking about only occurs in a small percentage of patients treated with TPA, five to seven percent. However, the bleeding is devastating and can result in 50 percent mortality. And for uh, that reason, uh, only a small percentage of the total stroke population or <clears throat> the other populations receive uh, TPA. Both the physicians and the patients are wary of administering TPA <clears throat> unless it's a very severe episode. So in the case of ischemic stroke, uh, there, uh, TPA is given, it uh, does its job in 60 minutes or so and restores blood flow, but then intracranial hemorrhage begins to occur or what's called hemorrhagic conversion, <clears throat> bleeding into the area of uh, uh, the infarct by the weakened blood vessels. And these can progress rapidly uh, and result in uh, severe disability and death. Our concept is that m will be used to, at the first sign of increased bleeding, uh, reduce our, and the activity of TPA by reversing it uh, with our m of FAB. So let's just spend a minute talking about hemostasis, the delicate balance that occurs in the body between coagulation and fibrinolysis, the dissolution of clots that form. In this simplified diagram, what we have is that uh, millions of times a day, minute areas of damage occur in the blood vessels that can result in uh, areas of damage that need to be repaired. Platelets and then the coagulation system produce fibrin clots at those sites of injury. As soon as those begin to form to seal the minute defect, the body begins to remodel those clots. By the uh, begins to remodel those clots by the uh, activity of the fibrinolytic system, and basically the fibrinolytic system. The fibrinolytic system is uh, driven uh, by the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin, uh, which actually then uh, dissolves or lyses the fibrin clots. TPA is a major driver of the plasminogen conversion to plasmin uh, and then the dissolution of the clot. So our problem is that the therapeutic activity of TPA persists. Normally the concentration of TPA is on the order of two to six nanograms per mil. So this is a normal range that I'm pointing out with my cursor. However, in order to lyse a large clot within 60 minutes of administration, uh, the concentration of TPA that's added is over a thousand fold higher than what's seen physiologically. And so despite the fact that TPA has an initial rapid half-life of only five to seven minutes, the terminal half-life is 40 minutes. And so this results in 16 hours of uh, TPA levels that are in excess of that physiologic level of TPA. And as a result of that, we have an increased bleeding risk for up to 24 hours. And most of these uh, severe bleeding episodes occur in the first eight hours. And so this is because we have that prolonged activity. 
the action of uh, beneficial action of TPA occurs in the first hour uh, after it's administered. And so we have uh, 23 hours of increased bleeding risk. And so initially what we plan to do is develop this as an acute uh, inhibitor of the TPA activity in the actively bleeding patient. But if superior safety is demonstrated, uh, then we'll uh, potentially be able to use it prophylactically after the clot has lysed to restore hemostasis uh, and decrease this bleeding risk. So this is a very attractive and short duration development program for a cardiovascular program uh, in that we can follow the precedent uh, set by uh, other companies that have developed uh, antidotes or inhibitors to the novel oral anticoagulants. And the first one that was developed was Praxbind, which inhibits the activity of Pradaxa, dabigatran. And so a small number of patients are needed to show that in vivo, uh, the activity of the, uh, the anticoagulant, or in our case, TPA, uh, would be inhibited. Uh, and then uh, the, the actual endpoint for approval is the TPA activity uh, reversal and, of course, the safety of the products. And so, uh, for example, Pradaxa, and we believe in our situation, only 350 or so patients would be required, uh, while the typical cardiovascular uh, development program is on the order of tens of thousands of patients and 10 to 12 years of development. And as we said, we'll do the first uh, uh, indication in the acutely bleeding patient, and then we will move forward with prophylaxis as a second indication. So our, uh, our inhibitor uh, antibody dose dependently uh, inhibits the human clot lysis in vitro and the mouse chimeric and fully humanized have similar activities. And our fab, uh, when compared to the, the murine in human, also dose dependently de decreases that uh, uh, human clot lysis. Now, the fab takes more uh, to uh, produce the same effect because it's univalent binding, whereas a full length monoclonal has bivalent, so it can bind two molecules of TPA. And uh, we've shown that there is efficacy of the antibody in the murine thromboembolic stroke model, reducing the amount of hemorrhage as seen above and then graphically displayed here as well as the amount of brain tissue that's destroyed or infarcted, and all the antibodies produce similar activity. It also decreases peripheral bleeding as uh, measured by tail bleeding time uh, in these mice, so that uh, we have a significant reduction in the amount of blood loss that occurs. So, we believe the evidence that we've generated shows that uh, uh, the animal model should be predictive of the human and being able to stop the, uh, the bleeding defects. Uh, we uh, believe that it's relevant to the TPA-induced uh, uh, syndrome and sh uh, should uh, translate to reductions in the, the amount of bleeding, the the mortality that occurs in the devastating intracranial hemorrhage uh, and uh, reducing the infarct as well uh, and reducing mortality should also improve functional recovery, that recovery that's worth living for. And on a final note, I just want to take a minute to mention that in our current epic of uh, the pandemic, uh, point out the fact that severe viral infections can also trigger thrombosis. And not only is it our COVID-19 infection, but 
and respiratory infections from flu virus, from uh, strep pneumonia, markedly increased the incident, incidence of uh, heart attack uh, and stroke uh, that can last for a month or more. And the shingles, herpes zoster, doubles the stroke risk and increases heart attack risk 70% for almost six months after an infection. And the COVID-19 is actually showing um, massive thrombotic activity and people are beginning to use TPA for fibrinolysis. And unfortunately, the first reports of death from fatal hemorrhage after TPA have been reported. And so this adds, impels us to move even faster in our development program. And so I think with that, I'll take um, the, uh, we've talked about the current status of the program, so I'll stop there and uh, take any questions you might have. Yep, so we did receive a question from Laura. Um, she's the Chief Technology Officer from Vectorgen, and she asked, is that effect bracket vascular leakage, close bracket, genetically linked? Genetically linked in that there are some um, polymorphisms uh, that result in increased activity of TPA. Uh, and uh, one thing that we didn't get to point out is the fact that, uh, for the sake of time, is that endogenous TPA uh, can actually cause severe hemorrhage as well. And in patients that have that uh, uh, SNP, uh, they will produce uh, increased levels of TPA that have more activity. For example, in multi-trauma, uh, or in prolonged cardiopulmonary bypass or near drowning, you have elevated TPA endogenously produced by the endothelium uh, that can result in the hemorrhage. And then those individuals with those SNPs of uh, gain of function in TPA, you do see uh, even more. Well, thank you for uh, your attention. Lead. It's been a privilege to speak with you today. Thank you, Jim.